Rowe is a assistant professor of law at uh, Willamette University in Salem, Oregon. Um, his research focuses on the legal design and regulation of money and finance, including digital fiat currency, as well as broader issues of law and political economy. Rowan has been instrumental in drafting and popularizing key pieces of legislation in the United States surrounding monetary policy, such as the Stable Act and the more recent eCash Act. Um, without much of a further ado, I will hand it over to you, Ro, and audience, as you have questions, please put them in the chat. I will be monitoring um, that for our Q&A session afterwards. Great. Can you hear me okay? All good? Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I'll just start by noting that um, obviously I'm, I'm affiliated with MMT and this is an MMT conference, but I chose the wording of this topic quite carefully that this is an agenda for what I consider to be the future of progressive monetary advocacy. I don't really want to get into a debate about where the line between what is and isn't MMT is. My view is that the reason most people get involved in MMT uh, and, and, and use it for their work is because they think it's important to making a better world and that this is a, a site of political struggle. And uh, from that point of view, uh, it, it's less relevant to me whether the things that we need to be doing as sort of monetary activists can be labeled MMT or not MMT as much as it is relevant to consider whether if you're the kind of person that likes MMT, you should be thinking about these things too. And in that respect, I see MMT as sort of an evolutionary growing paradigm that can and should incorporate those things, but I, I care less about the, the language than I do about the actual reasons why these are important issues. Um, so first of all, it's absolutely great to be here. Um, I uh, am very, very lucky to uh, uh, sort of be on the other side of, uh, of the past few years, not just uh, in terms of the real world, but in terms of what's been going on internally within the MMT community. Um, in particular, I want to have a huge shout out to Hannah Ashley and all the other new members of the MMN team that have taken over the reins and, and made this organization so much more than it ever was. The fact that we're using big blue button for this conference and, and sort of having a seamless virtual experience is, is in no small part thanks to their efforts and it's an absolute pleasure to watch um, them take uh, the ball and run with it so effectively. Um, MMT itself has also come a long way in the last few years. I'm sure everybody's experienced uh, COVID as, as lasting, you know, two years or 20, depending on how you're feeling. Uh, and it's definitely been one of those periods of history where, where decades happen uh, in, in weeks and months. Uh, and it's important, I think, at this point to to take stock and to sort of reassess the next steps, because whatever MMT was in, in the 90s and the early 2000s, whatever it was in the early 2010s, uh, it's, it's a different thing today. And it will continue to be a different thing. And it's our job to to evolve with the times and to lean into those changes. Um, so what, what are some things that have changed? I mean, first of all, uh, the prominence of the, the MMT paradigm, I think, has really taken off. There was a period where we were ignored. There was a period where it was a few fringe people on the blogosphere plus a few heterodox economists. There was a period where maybe some of the more um, insightful uh, financial journalists were, were interested. Uh, and then over time, it, it has become a, a phenomenon where politicians, uh, regular media uh, representatives and, and various groups, activist leaders uh, now at least name familiar with MMT. I wouldn't say, you know, you could pull an average person off the street, but I think you could probably pull an average second or third year economics student, you'd get something. Uh, and certainly the kind of people that read, read the Financial Times or The Economist and things like that are probably familiar with it sufficiently by now. Uh, and this this is not only in the popular discourse, this is also in the sort of halls of power. Uh, and it's, I think, very important to, to note that this work didn't just happen naturally. It was the result of a sustained campaign by particular people, by particular groups, including many of you on this call and, and the groups that you're affiliated with. Um, but this kind of stuff didn't wasn't inevitable. It, it sometimes feels inevitable on the back end. Uh, but it wasn't. 
there were moments when individual relationships had to be forged where particular tactical and diplomatic decisions had to be made that if they were made differently or if you know every lead mmt person were hit by a bus all at once we wouldn't be living in the world we are now and while there are certainly a lot of problems to still be solved i think if you look at the way that we responded macroeconomically to COVID and, and what we're doing now, and you compare that to what happened in 2010, 2011, it, it is such a different world. It is such a different kind of response and it plays out in the, the living standard increases and the fact that this, um, this response really didn't leave the very most vulnerable people behind the way the last one did to, to see, I think, the impact that these efforts have made and and i don't want to sort of be too self-congratulatory to our movement but i think it is important to to take credit where it's due and to sort of acknowledge that some of those long shot claims some of those long shot beliefs that might have seemed sort of tin hat crazy a decade two decades ago have been validated in, in a very significant way um and obviously this isn't you know, we're in the United States, but this is a this is not even a national phenomenon. This is a global phenomenon. Often, you, you sort of spend a lot of time in American circles, and you think, well, uh, this is only as good as the Democratic Party will let it be. But the reality is that a lot of people are paying attention at this point. A lot of policymakers, some good and some bad, obviously, but this is an issue that extends beyond um, one nation, one country, one set of problems. This isn't simply just a matter of justifying higher deficits by the US federal government uh, or something like that. There are a range of ongoing issues for which the MMT paradigm offers useful insights and, and potentially actionable steps. Um, perhaps one of my most favorite moments, and, and again, not to toot my own horn, was very recently having the opportunity to be on John Stewart with Stephanie Kelton uh, to talk about uh, the Federal Reserve and quantitative easing and a few other things. And obviously, um, John Stewart is not who he was in his heyday and, and his podcast is not his daily show. But if you think back, at least in my experience of the, just the ideological prominence that the daily show and John Stewart's voice had for a very large part of the early 2010s um, and, and the way in which he represented a sort of zeitgeist that kind of I'm socially liberal but fiscally conservative uh, to the point where when the first mint the coin proposal came out he went head to head fighting with Paul Krugman uh, which you know I don't think many of us have much love for Paul Krugman but the idea that this sort of self-professed clown was so confident in his beliefs uh, about macroeconomics that he, he could sort of laugh out of the room someone like Paul Krugman saying actually this mint the coin thing isn't stupid. It's it, there's a there there. I think it was a testament to the strength of how how dominant that ideology was at that time. And you fast forward ten years, and, and you hear him saying things like, "Well, back in the day, I used to laugh at the idea of printing a trillion dollar coin, but when I look around at what's been going on, um, it seems like we can we can sort of find the money for all these other things. So maybe we should just mint ten of them." Uh, and, and that shift, I think, that symbolic shift, what that represents, that someone like him is now taking seriously these ideas, I think is quite profound. Uh, and, and you're seeing it manifest in a lot of different places. Whatever the opposition was in the past has been worn down um, the way that rocks get worn down by rivers over time. It's just slowly chipping away until, uh, until those jagged edges have become smooth and accommodating. Um, so what are some of the victories? Getting practical, getting kind of into into the actual substantive claims. I think the first and most obvious one is we've been talking for the last two years primarily about inflation, not about deficits. I, I had the opportunity to write an article for The Nation right when the pandemic was first hitting, and I, I had a quote there from President Biden back when he was still running saying, or maybe he just won, um, saying, you know, you will not pay for this uh, pandemic. We out of the treasury will pay. We will do what we need to do. Now, of course, he didn't do what he needed to do, but the fact that that was the framing in that moment was such a sea change from the Obama years of we're out of money. Um, and even today, even as you're starting to see the Biden administration pivot back to deficit reduction in an attempt to tack to the center for the midterms and get Manchin on board with, with other legislative priorities, 
nobody's heart is in it. These people know that this is not a real framework. It's being deployed um, consciously cynically as well as just unconsciously cynically like it had been in the past. And I think that even then, even in that retreat from, from a larger victory, there's still movement. There's still a, a, something to celebrate there that we aren't coming up against people that don't know better, um, even if they know better and are making mistakes. The second thing is that, you know, tied to that inflation issue, there are sort of real resource constraint debates we're having now. We're talking about supply chains. We're talking about key critical inputs like semiconductors and energy. I mean, the, the idea that we would actually have a, an opportunity to, to discuss uh, what it means to have buffer stocks and to, uh, uh, to recenter production systems that are resilient in the face of international crises uh, I think, again, feels feels like a notable sea change from the way that debates over not only the past 10 years, maybe the past 25 years about globalization and trade have taken place. And you only need to look at the economists who uh, uh, have been sort of complaining about uh, the loss of hege hegemonic control over the discourse to, to see how um, different this is from the conversations that they had, people like Larry Summers had when they were uh, controlling the agenda. The next, I think, big MMT victory, and this one is maybe a little less intuitive, is, is a victory of pricing theory. And I want to kind of credit my colleague Nathan Tankus for really pushing certainly me and others in our little sub corner of the MMT world to take the kind of heterodox micro side, what we might call the kind of Fred Lee side of macro um, very seriously and, and, and to lead that work into the work of, of current antitrust scholars and, and people who are working on corporate power to look at the way that prices actually get formed, um, not, not simply to uh, discredit the, the crude monetarist quantity theory of money idea that it's always and everywhere, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, but also to go beyond the correct but, but incomplete story of fiscal spending and, and demand-led inflation adjustment as the you know, macroeconomic lever for, for full employment, uh, for price stability. The idea that sort of fiscal adjustment and a job guarantee are, are key price stabilizing levers is true, but also doesn't address other sources of inflation. And I think the fact that we are now talking about how prices actually go up and how to address those issues at their source uh, is, is a very positive development uh, that that MMT wasn't focusing on as a priority, but was always acknowledging was an important part of the story. Um, the next big cons uh, win, I would say, and I, again, I'll probably put this maybe as a as a partial victory or, or a sort of bittersweet victory, is the idea that um, in a world with large amounts of, of publicly issued uh, liabilities, whether they're treasuries or, or reserves or whatever else, uh, and, and in a world where we've had permanently low rates or significantly low rates for a long period of time, trying to, quote unquote, go back to normal by raising rates to maybe 5% or something has, has proved to be politically quite difficult. Uh, even facing inflation we're facing now, there is a, an observed reluctance on behalf of central bankers at the Fed and elsewhere to raise interest rates uh, up to the point that they could eventually be lowered again out of a perhaps misplaced rec uh, concern of causing recession or, or, or maybe a real concern. Uh, but either way, uh, the, the paradigm hasn't been destroyed completely uh, that, that says that interest rate adjustments are the best way to deal with inflation, but it has taken a significant uh, beating. It is much weaker than it was for years before that, where New Keynesians and others were convinced that um, simply simply raising rates would always be sufficient to to cool inflation on the top end because that's what Paul Volcker showed. Uh, and now I think there's a recognition that uh, that, that approach uh, w could be extremely harmful in ways that um, suggest we should be looking to other tools to manage inflation rather than jump into rate increases. Uh, the next, I think, victory, and again, this one's maybe a little bit more obscure, is that if you look at the way that COVID was responded to, for better or worse, the Fed really lent into liquidity facilities, including some very novel ones, not necessarily very well used or, or set up, 
But for example, the, the municipal lending facility was the first time that the Fed actually provided direct support to state and local governments, if, uh, if not in practice, in theory or on paper. Um, but compared to the 2008-9 crisis, uh, this time around the Fed was very ready to, to pump liquidity into the financial system. And um, while there were obviously problematic distributional implications of doing that without doing other things at the same time, uh, it, it, at least in my view, had a very Minskyan flavor. That is to say, focus a lot on, on the liquidity you provide, focus on a kind of big discount window model of financial system support and uh, wherever possible set prices and let quantities float rather than setting quantities and letting pricing float uh, and then lastly, and I don't think this is a uniquely MMT victory, but I think MMT gets to, to sort of feel happy about it too, is that I think the the idea that banks don't simply lend out other people's money, that they're not pure intermediaries, but in fact create money in the act of making loans has has gone quite firmly from, from fringe heterodox views uh, through to the mainstream uh, obviously, beginning back with that Bank of England paper in 2014, but I think nowadays it's it's a it's a dominant position uh, in in most serious uh, policy discussions. I was at a conference only a few weeks ago in with a bunch of law professors, law and finance professors, and they were saying how you know this issue has gone from one where if you say well banks create money, uh, a lot of orthodox people couldn't really understand what you're saying to to a point where that's almost um, presumptively uh, expected to be one of the first sort of sentences that you say when describing how banking works. And I think that has a lot of positive benefits. We haven't actually seen it manifest in policy debates around inflation and, and demand yet. That idea that a bank loan, just like public spending, can be a source of excess demand. Um, but we are, we are talking about <clears throat> money is being created not just with the public spigot, but in, in, in private finance as well. So I think these are some of the victories that we can be proud of and, and, and sort of take even while acknowledging that there's still a huge amount to be done. And, and in many respects, we may be further behind than we were when we started in, in the broader sense. Um, so what are some of the setbacks? What are some of the reasons we should also kind of be cautious and sober about, about the state of the union? Um, well, I think the first and biggest setback is that the job guarantee debate has been um, has been basically put on ice. You know, there was a point where this was discussed quite significantly in the 2020 primary. There was a point where this was a major focus of a lot of um, uh, Democratic Party discussions. And um, the Biden administration, the Biden team made very clear that it was not their interest at all, uh, both in the primary and since. It hasn't come up. It's been uh, off off the table of the agenda, and um, I don't frankly see any uh, any indication that that's going to change as long as this particular person is in the White House. So that's I think a really unfortunate moment, um, especially given that COVID would have been an excellent moment to reassess uh, what what it means to produce and to be involved with the economy. There have been conversations about the Great Quit and you know the the increased labor market disruptions we're experiencing now where people are finally realizing they have a bit of bargaining power. But I think perhaps in part because of COVID early on, the idea that we were paying people or we wanted people to not go out to work was very hard to, to square psychologically with the idea that really what we should be doing is paying people to, to have a job, but to be at home or to be temporarily not working, but to still do a lot of that support services through the framework of jobs and, and restructuring the economy rather than um, sort of having mass layoffs and then hope everyone will re-enter the same job market that they left on the other side. Um, I think another huge setback has been that MMT became popular or became popularly uh, relevant. And as a result, certain other economists, people who were not MMTers but like to have influence over how people understand the, the, the public discussion, used their platforms to uh, misrepresent 
the MMT position, and it was a lot harder for us to clarify that position on the other side of that misrepresentation, uh, in part because the caricature that was drawn was an easier one to understand. Um, and so being quite, being quite specific, um, there was this sort of representation that came out, I think it was really Josh Barrow at the New York Magazine first, and then it was, it was Mason and Jadev and others, Jadev, uh, this idea that really MMT is just learner's steering wheel. It's simply don't use monetary policy at all uh, and adjust everything with fiscal spending. So you can simply take the new Keynesian consensus that says do everything with monetary policy and leave fiscal policy and flip it on its head. It's really just the inverse mirror of the mainstream consensus. And I think this was a, a inaccurate and woefully impoverished vision of what we were actually proposing, but it was very easy for the mainstream uh, and the media class to wrap their head around. It was sort of the lowest common denominator of, of new thinking that they had to do to wrap their heads around some version of MMT. And so in the way that sort of Jonathan Swift said that falsehood flies and the truth comes limping after it, uh, or, or I forget the other rule, but the, that it's an, it takes an order of magnitude more effort to dispel bullshit than it does to create it. Uh, once people started understanding MMT as simply fiscal adjustments, then it was very easy to say, well, politically, it's very hard to adjust taxes in live time, so this is a dead end. And that was sort of the end of the story. Or to say, well, look, MMT says when there's inflation, you have to raise taxes. There's been inflation and nobody's proposing raising taxes, MMT must be dishonest or not really serious about its own policy prescriptions. Uh, when, of course, the MMT position was always, you raise taxes when it's appropriate and that it's one tool for addressing demand, but not always the most important one. Uh, but again, that kind of nuance didn't, didn't make it through, at least into some circles. And it's, it's very hard to, to know how many people who are now familiar with MMT are really familiar with this version rather than a more accurate version. And lastly, I think it's a victim of its own success in the sense that now everybody's paying attention to it and to say, wow, isn't it amazing that we had uh, a huge stimulus package that in part was possible because we didn't spend all this time talking about how to pay for it. Um, the, the chairman of the House Budget Committee, John Yarmouth, you know, has explicitly credited MMT and Stephanie Kelton for, for the courage to push for a huge bill. Um, Bernie Sanders, who was leading the fight in the Senate from the Budget Committee, obviously had Stephanie as his lead advisor or senior economic advisor. And the fact that, again, he started with a $6 trillion bill that was not quote unquote paid for um, was a victory for MMT. But as a result, when, when the, the powers that be uh, sort of did that thing, but didn't do the other things, that is to say, didn't start planning for inflationary risks at the same time, didn't incorporate other forms of demand management policy at the same time. Uh, when it didn't do those other things, the effect was that MMT got blamed for the negative outcome. Well, we tried your thing and now we have inflation. Uh, and, and that has been a, a difficult um, framing to respond to because again, it sounds like what we are trying to say is, well, we want credit for all the good things and none of the bad things. Uh, doesn't that sound convenient? In reality, of course, this is the nature of a game where you propose ideas and then other people get to take the parts of it they like and the parts they don't, they get to leave behind. So I think that is a useful cause for reflection for us in terms of how we package different parts of the same framework as um, indissoluble or, or non-negotiable. But, but it's also not, I think, true that uh, the inflation we're seeing today is a result of MMT because we proposed a number of things to deal with that. Most, most importantly, a job guarantee, but also other forms of demand management, other forms of price regulation that weren't even considered at all. Um, so I think at best you could say that they started following parts of MMT and then didn't follow others. And the, the failure is the failure of, of doing something half right. Uh, and then assuming that it's going to create half of the right result. Um, but of course, you know, you build half a car and you try to get in it and go down the highway. And you shouldn't be surprised if you crash very quickly. The other thing I think it's very important for us to acknowledge is that we aren't kind of in, in our parents' MMT universe anymore. 
Um, we are in a different world than we were in 1995, in 2006, certainly in 2010. And as a result, we need to reassess where our priorities are, not, not to sort of pretend that gravity doesn't exist or something on the other side of social events, but to acknowledge that all political economy, all intellectual movements are embedded in real world dynamics. They are responsive to and influencing of the broader social context that they're embedded in. And when that context changes, those movements should change. You know, we spend, I think, a, a bit of time in, in our little, again, corner of the MMT universe, criticizing some of our fellow leftists um, for, for assuming that all of the answers to the 2022 economy can be found in in, in 19th century Marx texts, um, as, as if Marx himself wasn't acutely aware of the evolving state of things and would probably have an entirely different set of thoughts today if, if he was around. So what is different today? What, what, are the, what are some of the reasons why we need to sort of go back to the drawing board and reassess some of the aspects of our political playbook that we have built um, in, in response to prior generational epochs? First of all, I think, we're in a post-Trump world. I mean, we, we know that any appeals to bipartisanship are not simply a sort of standard left-right world. There is a, a genuine proto-fascist movement around the world, and we have to be really careful not to, not to validate that in any way. Um, that includes playing games that sound intelligent but are actually long-term harmful, like, uh, like a lesser of two evils game where just because you hate the centrist powers that be, you, you find yourself jumping into bed with far right political figures simply because they're you know heterodox or anti-establishment. Um, but also substantively looking at questions like, you know, whether or not there really is a strong political constituency that cares about deficits. Um, seeing Trump say we can always print the money and running large deficits and no one caring, I think, woke up a lot of people on the other side that we used to believing that um, that that fiscal conservatism line was actually a real line. I think maybe uh, Ezra Klein was the most famous example of that, saying, I can't believe, you know, I took Paul Ryan's deficit hawk uh, shtick seriously. And the rest of us said, yeah, what did you, what did you think you were doing? Um, but I think in the post-Trump world, there is a recognition that the scope to, to engage in unusual politics is a lot larger than we thought before. If you can keep your base on board, if you can frame it in terms of a larger ideological shift that people want to have happen, the details almost don't matter. And and the fact that the, the Republican Party kind of went whiplashed from being a party of free trade to a protectionist party uh, almost almost overnight, um, I think, is, is an indication of just how malleable some of these political preferences, uh, policy preferences are. The second thing is, uh, is COVID, obviously. I mean, this is, this is our World War II moment in the sense that we had single largest disruption to the production system, single largest globally unifying event that completely changed our politics. I think probably 9-11 was, was the, the, the most recent analog before the global financial crises. But in many respects, this is sort of a combination of 9-11 and the global financial crises in the sense that it has a clear geopolitical dimension that the 2008 didn't have, or at least it was it resembled it's sort of America's at the top and everyone else is sort of underneath it. And then maybe Europe thing that, that feels a lot more normal. Whereas with COVID, there was a, a real question of you know, different regions having different approaches, different political uh, parties and, and ideologies in different places, taking different tacks uh, and, and a sort of reassertion that national boundaries and things like that uh, matter. Not a good, but they matter. Uh, and then similarly, I think there was a period when, when COVID first hit where we thought maybe maybe the inflation isn't going to happen. Maybe maybe this huge disruption to the production system for some reason isn't going to cause a huge problem. And then, and then eventually it did came, come. Uh, and we are now dealing with a problem that we didn't have for, for generations, which is uh, overly heated, um, not necessarily in demand terms, but in, in pricing terms and, uh, and, and a genuine supply chain issue, a genuine production chain uh, disruption, uh, where we, we're dealing with shortages in, in very key uh, goods that uh, are going to require a concerted response to deal with. 
Then, of course, there's the world of crypto, and, and this is a sort of world that I spend a lot of time in, slowly going insane. Uh, but uh, the, the crypto world, I think, back in maybe 2010 was, was a sort of quaint idea or, or interesting marginal fringe thing that you could sort of say, wow, look at that, and then go back to doing what you're doing. Um, today, I think it's very clearly um, here to stay and unavoidable. Uh, you can't get into the primary election debate. You can't get into the national discourse about the future of money and payments and banking without the crypto question rearing its head. There are uh, new kingmakers coming out of the crypto industry. There is this fusing of Silicon Valley and Wall Street that whatever industry comes out the other side is going to have some of the big, uh, most dangerous features of both of those current industries. Uh, and you have a a catalyzing effect on public discourse in the same way as Trump catalyzed the left that, that didn't exist or was, was relatively nascent at that point um, in, in opposition, uh, crypto has catalyzed a, a public debate around the future of digital money that might not have happened if if the powers that be had been able to get away with a kind of, if it, don't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it uh, framework. Uh, I, I, I like to joke to some of our friends that I, I'm not an accelerationist normally, but accelerationism uh, has has come to us over and over in the last few years. And I think between Trump and COVID and crypto, they, they're they great examples where the heightening of the contradiction also reveals a pathway uh, to, to a different politics that was previously obscured. Uh, next issue is obviously Ukraine. I think this has significance not only for supply chain issues, but for uh, geopolitics in general, perhaps the most significant move from a monetary advocacy point of view is is just the fact that they, the, the, the United States and others sort of crossed the Rubicon and really started freezing the assets of a major political player um, at, at their own central bank. The idea that diversifying your uh, national risk through holding assets with other countries is only as good as those other countries want to continue to acknowledge your existence. And at the moment, that's being framed primarily in terms of a, a, a sort of loss of innocence of globalization or something like that. But I think it also has quite important implications for how we understand the scope of tools available to nation states, um, to, to jurisdictions. Um, there was a lot of talk for years about the difficulties of enacting serious capital controls um, and the the possibilities of having sort of large inflows and outflows into a national financial sector that was sort of uh, uh, unavoidable. And at that point, the only counter examples were countries like China and South Korea that might not have been um, considered very analogous to, to a country like the United States. But nowadays, I think it's, it's clear that um, there will be a lot more boundary policing of capital flows between countries. Um, and, and that has important implications for uh, the range of tools we consider available uh, locally. And then just as a more broader point, uh, we're not in the world simply of Minsky's money manager capitalism anymore. We're in a world of surveillance capitalism where data and information uh, and, and social control through technological means are, are increasingly central. Uh, and, of course, a world where the climate bomb is ticking and ticking and getting worse and worse. And um, You only need to look at the absolutely horrific heat rave, wave going on across India and Pakistan right now to see the kind of dangers we're going to be experiencing more and more if you have a billion people who, who simply cannot stay in a place because it's becoming um, uninhabitable. That's going to create the kind of uh, geopolitical pressures that uh, lead to a very different kind of politics than we've experienced up until now. So what does that mean for us? I think that means that we don't have to um, go backwards on anything, but it does mean that we need to keep the MMT paradigm evolutionary. It needs to continue to evolve. The idea that there was a sort of fixed body of things that, that are MMT and that have stayed MMT and that have been MMT, I think is, is just not a useful or helpful way to understand this framework. We've had generations now of MMT scholars doing research, adding to the body of work, and in doing so, not only deepening and enhancing existing ideas, but also adding additional context that maybe changes how those ideas are understood, that provides additional 
uh, layers of meaning and reorients our priorities or reorients how we see those uh, policy issues. Before I get into the specifics of that, I just want to sort of have a shout out. We have recently set up a new 501c4, an action committee that does legislative work. And in part, this is a, a reflection of the fact that most of our little world are lawyers, but also because uh, as sort of Milton, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith once said about Milton Friedman, you know, one day you might be unlucky enough to actually have an opportunity to get your ideas put into practice. And it's easy enough to talk about policy changes that should happen, but when the time comes to actually make it happen, you need to get extremely granular and deal with all sorts of little tendrils and filaments and capillaries that may not have been obviously important. Uh, when you were just conceptualizing it, but at the point of implementation become maybe the entire ball game. So not to say that the details are the only parts that matter, but uh, when you wanna actually get over the finish line, you need to at some point start actually making the policy that you wanna see exist. And that leads us into a world of, of, of law making, of law writing and of working directly with elected officials. Um, my own experience with this started with a bill um, back at the beginning of COVID, which was a bill to provide emergency cash relief. It was not a UBI, but it was about as close to universal emergency uh, cash relief, I think would make sense from an MMT point of view. Uh, we used the symbolic framing of minting the coin to bypass the discussion about public debt and how to pay for it and borrowing from our grandchildren. Um, and we also spent a lot of time thinking about things that a lot of, uh, I think MMT discourse hasn't spent much time thinking about, which is the actual operational mechanics of distribution. MMT likes to talk about how we take operations seriously and, and it's great that we do, but often that usually means the operations of settlement, of central bank clearing, not the operations of how you actually get a $2,000 check or $2,000 worth of digital money to uh, 350 million people without missing anybody. So we started looking at questions like how you might actually create an emergency responder core that would go out like the census and knock on people's door and perform a wellness check and put, put money in people's hands. How you would deal with the underbanked and unbanked who don't um, have a bank account you can direct deposit that money into uh, or even maybe an address where you could go and find them and how you might, again, try to reach out to those people uh, we, we thought about how you might deal with undocumented people, people who might be very afraid to put their name on any database and, and how we might deal with the issue of scaring um, marginalized people away from receiving benefits that they need um, in a way similar to how uh, right-wing voter ID drives are designed to discourage uh, black communities from voting under the guise of, of needing to see their identification. Uh, and those concerns led us to write a bill that really focused on uh, not only sort of minting the coin, which became the rallying cry, but on on the, the process of issuing a prepaid debit card, why it was important for this money to come out in a particular form, in a material form of a prepaid card rather than an account, so that you had all the benefits of physical cash, but also all the benefits of digital payments. Uh, and... Uh, that bill ended up being co-sponsored by, I think, about 20 members of Congress, including most of the members of the squad and Pramila Jayapal, the co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. And if you, if you think about it, how maybe even 10 years ago, the idea of getting anyone in Congress to say anything vaguely MMT-like, let alone we're going to print a trillion dollar coin, was completely anathema. The fact that we got some of the leading progressive lights is, I think, a pretty big uh, coup. Notably, this wasn't framed as the MMT bill in any way, and I don't think even would be considered that, but it was obviously informed by MMT and the fact that we managed to come up with talking points and, and that politicians were willing to actually articulate, I think is, a, is an important lesson for the rest of our community about the, our choice of messaging and our choice of intervention strategy. If I had gone in and spoken to these Congress people and said it needs to be an MMT bill, you have to call it the MMT this, 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 they wouldn't have done it. Um, but we did it this way, and in doing so, not only did we have a, a pretty big impact on the debate, uh, it was only days after this was announced that 
Uh, Vice President Harris released her own similar proposal and so did Senator Sanders. Uh, at that point, we were the only ones calling for $2,000 and, and after that, they both started calling for $2,000. Um, but also it, it allows us to get in the room with these elected officials who really should be on our side and are on our side. They just normally don't know how to do it and, and to start building those relationships for other uh, efforts. So from there, we also ended up working on a bill on public banking. And again, this is not, I think, a, a top MMT priority because a lot of the MMT framework, I think, is based around emphasizing that there are things we should be doing with spending rather than lending. Um, and that, you know, when you have the power of the purse, you don't need to create a bank um, to do the same job. But of course, state and local governments don't have the power of their own purse. And in those contexts, using institutions like public banks can be very important. And of course, there is a very large progressive movement, including many MMT adjacent allies who do care about public banking. So how can MMT inform that debate? How can we shape that debate in a way that's consistent with our larger priorities and, and remove some of the most harmful or misconceived components? Well, part of what we chose to do was to have a federal bill, federal law, that did not establish federal public banks, but it enabled state and local banks to set up their own, uh, state and local governments to set up their own banks. Uh, that allowed, provided public support, federal funding, federal reserve system access, uh, but was really aimed at providing a unifying federal focal point for public banking advocacy at the local level level. And we, through that process, made a lot of connections with the public banking community. I think we sort of showed people in that community that MMT is not hostile to them, even if we don't agree with everything they do. And in doing so, made public banking a kind of MMT, um, part of the larger MMT vision. Um, others like Bill Mitchell have written for years in favor of public banking. Randy Ray and Jan Kregel had talked in the past about a network of community banks. So I don't think it was not in the literature, but again, there were reasons why politically uh, it made sense to lean into that legislation at that moment. Then on the crypto side, um, myself and, and colleagues like Raul Carrillo were working on the question of how to have an intervention into this emerging crypto ecosystem uh, that again was consistent with MMT principles. And one of the aspects that we looked at was how particularly stable coins, not, not private currencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum, which have got other problems, uh, but, but really stable coins that are denominated in a public unit of account and the promise or give the impression that they're promising at par convertibility were really a form of shadow banking. And we talked a lot about shadow banking in the early 2010s after the global financial crisis, and there was a lot of Minsky, and there was a lot of Ray, and there was a lot of others, including people that I would consider fellow travelers of MMT, like Daniela Gabor, writing about shadow money, and, and people like Perry Merling, writing about uh, shadow banking, uh, Zoltan Posar, and, and Paul McCulley, and others. So that, that literature, that understanding that one of the big problems of 2008 was we had actors doing the bank thing without the bank license uh, and in doing so uh, creating forms of money that were not as safe as public money uh, that that was a issue that the crypto ecosystem was a bit was replicating in lifetime and while it's hard to shut down a private currency like bitcoin entirely it's it's a lot less hard to shut down stable coins and as the crypto ecosystem learned very quickly uh, liquidity particularly liquidity denominated in the public unit of account is extremely important to the entire ecosystem. If you don't have that ability to, to go in and out of crypto, then it's basically a siloed island. But if you do have that ability, then it can build on top of the existing financial system while pretending that it's outside of it. So we put this bill out there and it, it broke a lot of crypto people's brains. We got in a lot of, uh, a lot of heat for it. Uh, and at that time, uh, we were some of the only people making those claims in the end of 2020. Since then, the president's uh, uh, working group on stable coins led by the Treasury Secretary released a large report 
where they came down in the same position that we did. This is now the administration's default position that stablecoins should be regulated like banks and have deposit insurance. And uh, as a result of that, we also forced a kind of MMT paradigm about why public money is uniquely safe relative to private money uh, into the debate around crypto uh, on our terms. And again, this isn't because I think that the hope for the future lies with crypto, but if we are not paying attention, if we don't have an opinion, if we don't have something to add to the most important monetary political debates of our time, then I think it's very hard for us to call ourselves modern uh, monetary theorists. We can say we were uh, modern monetary theorists circa 1995 and haven't updated our thinking, but that isn't very helpful to people who are looking to us for guidance and leadership on how to address the problems of the world today. Most recently, uh, again, our colleagues at PMA worked on a bill called the Electronic Currency and Secure Hardware or eCash Act. Uh, and this was an attempt to uh, add something to the debate around a digital dollar or what's being called problematically a central bank digital currency. Uh, this bill actually did not establish the eCash proposal at the central bank, but at the treasury, and that was a clear MMT influence. Um, but what it was essentially doing was saying that we need to think about, kind of like the ABC Act, that the, the payments mechanism, the way that you get money to people is very, very important. Having a guaranteed job for everybody, having decent pay, having decent benefits, having public goods for housing and things in a world where every transaction is surveilled and censorable is still a dystopian nightmare, in my opinion. That is to say, it isn't good enough for us to say, well, let's just make sure everyone can earn money and then we'll have made a just monetary system. We need to actually make sure the way that they hold and use that money isn't a net negative as well. And so what we were looking at was debates around giving everybody a bank account at the Fed, giving everyone a postal banking account, giving everyone a public banking account, and saying this is all well and good, but if we don't keep something that looks like cash, where you can hold it in your pocket, where it doesn't keep a record of transactions, where you can be anonymous and maybe send it to political dissidents or people in the gray economy or undocumented people without worrying that your money is tracking you and sending your data to central command or to the secret police, then we're building a panopticon. If we don't have that, we're building a totalitarian monetary regime. In countries where they barely use cash anymore, your choices are to not use money at all or to use surveilled money. And again, this is the kind of issue that in my opinion, MMT cannot ignore. And it is no coincidence that we had Brett Scott at the first MMT conference in Kansas City all those years ago, uh, because Brett was talking all the way back then about the war on cash and about the need to protect cash as a form of monetary technology. And this is an attempt to, to sort of uh, build on that form of monetary politics and bring it into the digital world and say, we need a digital equivalent of cash. And again, this was a bill that ended up getting proposed by Congressman Stephen Lynch, who's the chair of the FinTech task force. He's no leftist by any means. He's a moderate. Uh, and it has got a huge amount of press in, in circles that previously might have had absolutely no interest in anything uh, MMT related. But while this isn't a bill for a job guarantee or for reforming the budget, it is a bill to use the Treasury's power to create money to inject it directly into circulation. And in that respect, is sort of dripping with MMT, even if it doesn't uh, say its name on its tongue. And then lastly, um, with the caveat that I mentioned earlier, that there's very little chance that this is going to get picked up by the administration, we had the opportunity to work with Congresswoman Ayanna Presley and other members of the squad to uh, develop a job guarantee resolution that was a, not a full bill, um, because as it turns out, <laughs> writing a whole uh, bill to establish a, a a new jobs program that would be the centerpiece of a, a revitalized economy is the kind of task that you need dozens and dozens of um, stakeholders working around the clock to deal with all the nuances, w workplace labor laws, union issues, 
regional variation issues, all of those kinds of things. Uh, so this was not a full bill, but it was a resolution. And that resolution, I think, articulated a, the most comprehensively progressive vision of a job guarantee uh, that any legislation, at least in the United States, has considered since the, the 70s. Uh, and, and there's more work to be done on that front, but the fact that we even had, again, uh, uh, leading progressive Congress people willing to stand up and say, this is something I want to put my name behind, uh, was a big win. Obviously, in the 2016-2020 primaries, Senator Sanders had job guarantee as part of his platform, uh, but uh, no comprehensive bill ever emerged out of that. So this is still the the, the most progressive version of a job guarantee legislation that has come out of Congress. Others, including Cory Booker and um, uh, Roy Canna, put put their sort of watered down job guarantee and name versions out there. Um, but I, I think this still remains the most um, comprehensive vision and one that uh, is influenced very significantly by MMT concepts. Outside of the federal level, we also have local and state elected officials uh, working on calls to have federal revenue sharing, federal transfers, uh, to provide f local uh, federal support for complementary currencies, uh, and to start situating other institutions like universities as sites of potential local monetary activism. Uh, this work happens uh, in, in ways that aren't necessarily always legislative, but are uh, building a kind of model politics that can then be adopted in different states and localities when we have new allies. So lastly, what's next? There's a couple of things. I think first of all, we need to lean in to getting granular on the regulatory side. Remember, we are the operations people and that includes legal operations. That means developing theories for price regulation, working with antitrust uh, activists and, and scholars like Sandeep Vahisan and, and Lena Khan and, and Sanjuk Paul and others uh, to, to deal with the private corporate power side of the macroeconomic investment story and of the price stability story. There's no point spending all this time worrying about fiscal stabilizers only to let corporate price gouging cause so much inflation that the average person can't tell the difference between a good and bad inflationary environment. Uh, it means taking industrial policy seriously, the Green New Deal and, and how we balance uh, real resource allocation and, and public versus private uh, goods provisioning uh, is, is a very important question. Uh, then, of course, from my point of view and for others in, in our side of the MMT world, uh, the, the idea of having a universal basic wage for a job guarantee is an extremely useful political tool for uh, uh, keeping the focus on the lowest common denominator, making sure that we're lifting the floor of the labor market. But again, if we want to be actually useful and relevant to, to real politics, uh, there is no world in which we pass a job guarantee that doesn't have the support of, of labor, not, not necessarily every organized labor person, but of the labor movement. Uh, and the labor movement is not going to support something they think does not help preserve their hard-won labor gains across other parts of the labor system beyond the minimum wage level. And so rather than necessarily having to incorporate that into the job guarantee, we can think of adding on top of it a layer that in, uh, provides wage premiums, provides uh, additional income beyond that minimum wage for particular purposes. If we want more nurses, we can say that the base wage for the job guarantee is $20, but if you want to be a nurse and have a nurse's license, we'll pay you an additional $6 an hour. So for nurses, there's a base job guarantee of $26, which is the $20 base wage plus the $6 premium. And this is a way to link the MMT focus on full employment with workforce development, with skills and credentials and experiential training. And again, that goes into industrial policy. And I was looking for the quote and I couldn't find it, but there's a quote from Minsky where he says, look, the first thing we need to do is make sure we have, quote, tight full employment. But the next step is we need to upgrade the workforce. It's not enough just to make sure there's no unemployment. We need to make sure they're good jobs. They're the best jobs. They're people being the most productive and useful and, and self-fulfilling versions of themselves they can. And that means things like ongoing workforce development, higher education reform, industrial policy, incomes policy, where we set at a, as a social priority what industries we want to pay more and why.
And lastly, regulatory reform dealing with taxes uh, and, and making sure we have a, a, cons a, a framework that works for tax reform uh, in a progressive sense. Uh, fiscal, we need to reform our budget. We need to get rid of this sort of false framing that we're borrowing to spend. Uh, we need to, as Stephanie Kelton has argued, reform the CBO so that we're actually analyzing inflationary risk, uh, not uh, repayment or interest rate risk. We need to incorporate fiscal auto stabilizers so that we uh, are not uh, going back to Congress every time there's a new issue, but rather are setting frameworks that can adjust in response to changing circumstances. People like Claudia Sam have done work that can be easily integrated into an MMT framework. Uh, when you think about the distribution of spending uh, on an ongoing basis, it's not enough to say we need more money. We need to always be framing that in terms of we need more money for some people and not others. And lastly, we need to think, take seriously what it means to restructure the economy around decommodified services. I think people are obviously aware of, of movements around, again, free higher education, Medicare for all, housing for all, and, and their relationship to a job guarantee. But one example I want to provide that people don't spend too much time thinking about is, is that of intellectual property. And I wrote a small little chapter years ago, but I hope we can sort of spend more time talking about it in the upcoming years, which is that if a job guarantee worker makes a piece of art or writes an academic article or does an ethnographic history or, uh, or writes a, a, a newspaper article, who owns the intellectual property? Is it private? Is it theirs? Is it the company they work for? Is it the nonprofit they work for? Is it the government? What license is that under? Can we remix it without paying a fee? Does the public get to consume that for free or do they pay one per stream for the music? These are the kinds of questions that, that are not answered simply by saying, we'll give someone a job. How is the job relating to the output? Who has a claim on the output in what way? Those are the kinds of questions we need to start asking if we want to deepen the MMT framework's relevance to the next generation of policy. Then monetary policy, we do have low interest rates right now, but we need to talk about how to deal with private investment. If we do have an overheated economy, we need to have a framework that allows us to compare the merits of a public school versus a casino. Uh, one gets a bank loan, one gets a public grant. How do we make sure we're prioritizing one or the other when we have to make trade-offs amongst limited resources. Do we need treasury securities? No, but if we want to try to get the treasury debt out of the fiscal debate without having to convince everybody we don't need a securities market because that might be two bullets to have to fire when we only have time to fire one, one option is we can let the Fed do the securities issuance. Treasury makes money, Fed makes securities, Fed uses securities for monetary policy. It has nothing to do with fiscal spending. Um, we can have a more Minskian focus on the discount window. Every private financial instrument can be liquidated at a price. What we need to do is work out those prices. We can have a, a monetary policy focused around the financial stability of the financial system in the context of tech. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we can have uh, a conversation about international coordination through this new realm of swap lines that we've built, um, not only between countries, but also within a country at a federalist sense, um, we can have state and local governments enjoy uh, a, a monetary pluralism, being able to potentially issue their own currencies that get support from the federal government, just like a university within a state could issue its own currency. Uh, digital, we really need to lean into this. This is the way to capture the public imagination about money. We need to talk about universal access to public accounts. The fact that the banking system is quasi private or a franchise public good does not mean that it's good enough. We need to think about the privacy and anonymity political impacts of the money that we use. We need to think about the root and branch infrastructure of banking. It's not enough to say the Fed is gonna give everyone a bank account if the Fed doesn't have a single branch teller that can uh, uh, take someone's queries when they've got a problem. We need to deal with the, the risks of the private money uh, perimeter. And we need to think about a broader framework for data minimization and privacy. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much for your presentation. I know I learned a lot. Um, I hope everyone else did as well. 
Uh, the chat has been absolutely, absolutely great. There's been some great discussions going on in the chat as you were presenting. Um, but PG asked a great question. Um, in understanding how the key the key policy implication of the jobs guarantee was kicked was forced off the table is important. Um, in your opinion, what happened behind the scenes in the battle over the Green New Deal brand, and what impact did the universal basic income onslaught have? Yeah, good question. I don't think that the basic income in, uh, onslaught had much of an effect. I don't think it was really a basic income versus job guarantee because the people that were opposing a job guarantee were not people proposing a basic income, or at least the ones opposing it with power. The power was coming from the Biden wing, and I think it was simply a matter of moderate versus progressive. The the way that the Dems in 2009 framed their intervention then, and there's a, there's a speech from Obama to the Small Business Administration. It was like a not very significant speech in general, but I thought it was really telling, where he said, when we came into this crisis, we were guided by a simple idea. That idea was that governments can't create jobs, but they can create the conditions that allow the private sector to create jobs. They can't invest themselves, but they can create the conditions through tax breaks that allow small businesses to invest. And that was such a pure distillation of the neoliberal idea that, well, we can't do it. We can only let the private sector do it. We can make the private sector, you know, feel good about itself and maybe it'll save us, but we can't save ourselves. And President Biden was there for eight years of that. He was standing there. He was part of that regime. A lot of the people that went into his admin were the people in that admin. And I think nothing about the last eight years convinced them that they were wrong about that. Nothing about the last eight years convinced them that that was not a political winner for them. The public was not yearning for socialism or something. And so when the job guarantee got framed, um, not 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 framed poorly, but like in those debates when it was something that Bernie said, "Hey, we should do this." Biden sees that and goes, "Oh, that's sort of that's the that's the public ownership of the economy thing. That's the European answer." I think the other part, if we if we're going to be more sort of brutal about it, if there was a resistance group, I think it was the unions. I think if Biden went to the the senior union leadership and said, "What do you think about this?" and people like Bill Spriggs at the AFL CIO said, "We don't care about it that much." or people like Josh Bivens at EPI said, we don't really like it that much. Or even people like Mike Konzel and Josh Mason at Roosevelt, literally FDR's think tank when he made the job guarantee the centerpiece of his economic bill of rights. They said, no, we don't really like it. Then Biden looks around and goes, okay, we, then nobody's gonna be pressuring me to do this if I don't want to. And, and when you had Hickenlooper on one side saying, no, absolutely not, <laughs> and Bernie Sanders saying absolutely yes, then it's pretty obvious which side Biden's gonna fall on because he sees himself as reaching the moderates in his party. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I will just quickly for the audience, due to our webinar format, I don't have a great way to quickly unmute people. So if you have questions, please feel free to uh, put them in the chat. That's gonna be the easiest and most efficient way to get questions to our speaker. Um, Raul in the chat is asking, what do I do if crypto is taking over my neighborhood slash block slash city slash state house? I mean, yeah, thanks Raul. <laughs> um, I, so this is, I think the challenge here is the same challenge that is, that we should be good at. That is to say MMT, one of the reasons it was successful is it saw in 2008 and nine that there was a really important problem that the orthodoxy had failed to properly address. Everybody was trying to understand what the hell just happened, how the macroeconomy works, what we thought we understood in textbooks was wrong. And MMT was one of the only groups saying, here's an alternative way of understanding it that people found convincing. It was that energy, it was that solving a problem for people in their mind that I think gave us an in, allowed us to bypass the gatekeepers of the economics profession, the popular discourse. Now, what we're seeing now with crypto is there's a real problem. The public doesn't have a good payment system. They don't like feeling like everybody's surveilling their, their stuff all the time. They don't like the fact that the government can shut down bank accounts or if you're undocumented or unbanked or something, you, you're pretty much shit out of luck. And so what does crypto say? Crypto says we're going to give you instantaneous, easy, no red tape, 
privacy respecting money. And we're going to give you some yield. We're going to give you some returns on your investment. That last one, I think, is a matter of dealing with other issues, better pensions, better job security, better income security, better savings, less debt, all that stuff. But on the payment side, the, the response from, from the policy apparatus is, well, don't complain that much. We've got instantaneous Fed, account, um, Fed now coming. The banks have just created Zelle. It's not that bad. And when you, when you posit something that looks like the future, we're leading into the money of the future, and the other response is, nah, the, the, the status quo is fine. You lose. So I think it's really important to be, when we're being skeptical of crypto, because I think it is a, mostly a bunch of scammers and certainly right-wing you know, pro-market people, it's important to validate the feelings that people got to crypto with. Not crypto itself, but to say, I get why you're attracted to this. There's a better way. Don't, don't confuse your selfishness with a vision for the future. Don't confuse these private guys hocking a grifter product with an actual vision for public money. But we can't simply just talk about the kind of pro-government. We're here, we're here to do good. Don't you think that we can do good things? Because the people who are already skeptical of the government are just not going to find that convincing. But what they might find convincing is, that cash is the sweet spot between a public good with privacy characteristics. If you like privacy, good, we agree with you, but you don't want to use that risky private product. You want to use something that's tried and true like the cash in your pocket. Has anybody here been offered a hundred dollar bill and not taken it? You really hate fiat so much that if I offered you a hundred dollars right now, you wouldn't take it. Of course you'll take it. Do you ask to be paid in, in gold bars? No. So don't, don't, pretend like your problem is with fiat money. Your problem is with a payment system that doesn't work for you and is hostile towards you. We agree. We have a better vision than them. That's the response, I think. Lean in. Be, be bigger and more bold than the other side. Absolutely. Uh, Mauricio from Costa Rica is saying, They've recently formed a small MMT group and would like to start having some political influence. Um, do you have any insight as to what a strategic way to approach uh, representatives are for them? Um, is the idea of a job guarantee something that seems uh, feasible to breach sort of an understanding of MMT with elected officials? I think one of the real challenges for MMT activists is that it's really exciting and empowering to finally understand this stuff. When it clicks, you sort of see it like a magic eye painting. And you want to share it with everybody. You want to share the good news, just like every zealot in history. And I mean that in a very with love. But the challenge is that other people don't necessarily appreciate the enthusiasm until they've experienced it themselves. And it can come across in a way that is alienating. It can come across as someone saying, hey, I've got the answer, you don't. You need to listen to me and shut up. And that's not a way to organize. It's not a way to build power. It's certainly not how you get people to join a bloody union. So why would it be to get them to join this political coalition? One of the challenges, I think, is that if you really want to get something from people, you need to come not with your hand out, but with an offer of help. You need to spend enough time to understand them, understand where they're at, understand what they're doing, and then work out how you might be able to use the goodwill that you've built to educate them on those things. Um, Fred Hampton used to say the Black Panther Party, you know, we provide uh, breakfast programs to kids. And that's not because everybody thinks, oh, that's socialism, but they get, the mothers of the kids go, I don't know what socialism is, but I like that they feed my kids. And that idea of, I don't know what MMT is, but I like that they're helping me solve problems that I have to deal with every day. I don't know what MMT is, but they're the guys that turn up to my little local activist group and are always there. They're always friendly. They're always easy to work with. They do their work. They're not always hijacking the conversation with their own shit. When they do speak, I want to listen because they listen to me. So I think that's the starting point. You want to help these people, you need to work out what they need. And then you'll know how to make what you need from them make sense to them. Absolutely. A follow-up question in the same vein, I think. Um, what's the easiest uh, 
win or short-term goal at the local level that people can be fighting for? Easiest win? Easiest win? I mean, it, it, I guess it depends whether you've already got a sympathetic person. Um, if you've got a sympathetic person, someone who, who at least goes, yeah, look, I get what you're saying. It's hard, but I get what you're saying. So what do you want me to do about it? I can't lose an election. You don't want me to get kicked out. So what can I actually do? One easy win is that idea what I, uh, if you go to local bailout for the many.org, it was a letter that we put together that had over 100 local elected officials. And it was basically saying that in the middle of COVID, we need federal support because we don't have the money power. They do, we don't. Wasn't requiring anything out of the state and local budget. It wasn't requiring you to even attack the other side. It was simply saying, we can't fix this problem with the tools that we have that you uniquely have. And I would put, if possible, if I was running every bill out of a state state legislature, I would put at the beginning of every spending bill, every single one, a preamble that says, recognizing that the, the state government does not have the money power and it is not in the best position to provide these essential public services, but recognizing that the federal government is not doing its job, comma, this house does blah, blah. Does that change anything substantively? No, but what it is, is just a constantly annoying refrain that sticks in people's heads. Makes really clear every single debate we're having in a city government about how to find a little bit of money for this pothole or that pothole is because we've failed to provide a federal transportation framework. Every single time there's a school board fighting over how much money goes to the music department versus the sports department. It's because the federal government has failed to invest in K-12 education. And if we can make that point to everybody, if we can tell them you're hacking at the branches and that's fine, but there is a route. And if we are not hacking at the route, we are not going to win. Then that to me is, I think the lowest cost. Now in terms of actually getting a bill passed, it really depends on the local politics. It depends on what's there at the moment. You might be able to get a trial job program. You might be able to push for a public bank. You might be able to uh, try and find um, some sort of way of reforming the budget process, some way of reforming the, the, the bond issuance tax relationship. Um, maybe you're in a state that has a balanced budget amendment. You need to get rid of that and try to explain how. There's all sorts of things you can do. But I would say the cheapest, easiest one is just to constantly be pointing out we're in the wrong room. Absolutely, most definitely. I think that's great points, reminding people, you know, when their attention's at the local level, it's because of the failure of the federal government to provide. I think that's a, a key piece of insight there. Um, sorry, just also trying to catch up with the chat and see what's going on. I mean, Pody is right. The Black Panthers got crushed. Pody's saying we have to learn from the lessons of why they didn't succeed too. I mean, I think he's right. They got crushed in part because they were so threatening. And I think one of the things that our colleague David Stein does a really good job of talking about when he talks about the last big push for full employment, the job guarantee in the 60s and 70s is they had a much bigger coalition than we did. They had the environmentalists, they had the women's movement, they had the labor movement, they had the civil rights movement, and they still got crushed. We are so far behind that and we have less time. Now, I don't think that the bunch of people that got obsessed with money are the kind of people that can answer all the questions about how to deal with the violence of the state when the FBI comes down on us. But I do think there are people that care and think about that. There are groups that are working on those issues and we can and should be friends with them and ally with them and learn from them. I was just having a conversation the other day with Will Lawrence, one of the co-founders of the Sunrise Movement. And he was asking this exact question. He was saying, I don't know whether we actually got close with Bernie or whether it was all a complete mirage and we were never even close to doing anything at all. Now, I do think that we are imaginatively much more dead as a collective than we were in the 60s and 70s. And if we don't bring that imagination level up a little bit, it's going to be difficult. But that is only a precursor to the real fight. It isn't the real fight. And I, I would never want to underestimate how bad that's going to get. I will say, looking at the way that everything happened with January 6th, looking at the way that the far right is mobilizing here, looking at the way that Bolsonaro and, and you know Orban in Hungary 
we may be really doing something more like trying to prep the grounds for what comes after some sort of serious civil conflict. And I don't think we're the leaders of that civil conflict, but we might have something to say about the monetary regime and make sure that we're on the right side of it and that we're paying attention. Definitely. Amy has a follow-up question about the local bailout for many campaign um, and whether or not there's a vision for that to be an ongoing coalition uh, and whether or not it was making any noise at the federal level in terms of swap lines, complementary currencies, et cetera. Uh, it came too late, I think, to really have an impact on that federal uh, issue. And when it, um, uh, when it came out, it was shortly followed by the CARES Act, and that really took a lot of the oxygen out. Uh, uh, the municipal loan facility, I think, was announced um, either shortly before or shortly afterwards. And so that was a sort of, well, maybe we wait and see what this would look like. I think it was shortly before. Um, and, but no, I, I wouldn't say this is a sort of one to, to emulate. It was just the first time that we had an opportunity to do this. And it started because there were four or five members of the Chicago City Council, aldermen, who were part of Democratic Socialists of America that were supportive. And we had to, again, do the same kind of education work that we did with the, with the federal legislators, with the squad. And it, it's not that that was the, the one action that, were, uh, that, that solved everything, but that group and that hundred campaigners could be mobilized in the future or are at least a proof of concept that we can do this, that this is what it could look like. Now, I don't think we're there yet. I think it's going to take a lot more work, but that that is a blueprint for how you might frame it, how you might talk about it at the local level, I think is important. Definitely. Um, and, you know, speaking of the local level, um, Raul is mentioning lots of people are working with unions. Uh, can you briefly talk about sort of the... Fisher in labor support for the jobs guarantee, for example, Sarah Nelson, um, and, you know, direct job creation. Yeah, great question. I mean, so I come from Australia where we, in theory, have a labor party, and I lived in the UK where there's a labor party, uh, and, and a lot of my early research before I sort of got into law at MMT world was on, um, uh, on union in structures and, and incomes policies uh, as a macroeconomic price stabilization tool. And one of the challenges is that in a lot of European contexts, particularly ones where they have what's called tripartite negotiation structures where big business, big labor and government sit around a table and work out, you know, prices and, and wages and overtime and, and those kinds of things collectively, uh, is that the unions consider full employment really their responsibility. This is in part why people like Matt Bruning don't like the job guarantee, because when they look at the noise, the Nordics say, well, we'll have unemployment insurance and we'll have union level job protections. The idea that a right to a job is something that comes from the state to you and doesn't go through the organized labor movement is seen as a threat to the organized labor movement. It takes away one of the biggest things they have to offer their membership, which is we're protecting your jobs. Now, to their credit, the concern is they know not to trust the state. That's why there is a labor movement. Uh, and unless you have some actual political coalition to ensure that this thing doesn't become workfare or become a race to the bottom or hollow out other wages, we have a really serious credibility problem with the labor movement. I think this is a really important thing for MMTs to think about when we have debates, for example, about a single basic fixed wage for a job guarantee or a tiered wage structure. Is it more nuanced and messy to do a tiered wage structure? Yes. Are there benefits to focusing on the universal base wage as a political organizing framework? Absolutely. Are we going to ever convince all the unions who fought tooth and nail for $18 instead of 15 that a $15 job guarantee is helping them rather than going to undermine their efforts? No. So we need to think about what that looks like. Um, luckily, there are some labor leaders who see the potential here see its significance to a Green New Deal, see its significance to the strength of the labor movement, going back to this being a major demand of organized labor in the 40s and 70s, this being a huge part of the ILO's framework, this being part of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, etc. cetera. Uh, and Sarah Nelson from the Flight Attendants Union, uh, CWA, is, is, is definitely um, one of the leading lights on this, probably the strongest, and is in the process now of trying to run for the AFL-CIO president position. I don't know if she's announced, but you know, exploratory committees exist. And I think that kind of 
debate is happening within the labor movement. You know, there was a point in 2017 where, where Trumpka was supporting Trump or being very pro-Trumpist. And so in part, it's that there's a, the, the labor movement has its own demons to, to excise right now. But in part, it's also that we need to take seriously meeting them where they are if we want to have them as allies. And again, to go back to the Pody point, there's just such a, a powerful enemy on the other side that if we, we think we're going to get anything done without the unions, we're dreaming. Definitely. Dr. Hammond in the chat is mentioning that we have the same problem with M for A, Medicare for all in the United States. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, it, again, this is not our fight alone. There are a lot of people that have been spending years working on Medicare for all, and part of our job is to meet that movement and add enough value to them that they want to take us seriously on some of the big things. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, not, not, not to, not to be defeatist, but being appropriately humble about what we actually have solutions for with this movement versus when we just sort of, our job is to turn up and be one voice in the protest. And, and, you know, if, if we see things come up that are in our realm to, to deal with them and, and help, but the challenge of how to, bring healthcare to a country that's still fine with killing their people uh, is, a, is a very difficult political challenge that I don't think can be reduced to a question of monetary design. Definitely. Thank you so much for your time. I'm looking, it looks like we've gotten through all of the audience questions. We do still have a couple of minutes left if anyone else has some last minute questions. Um, or anything that they want to chime in with before we wrap up. I will just give people a moment to stick that in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Ro. So, um, talking about ways to enforce uh, the right to a job um, as, you know, stratified by the amount of power that they have to actually do that, you know, constitutional property rights, labor department mandates, and uh, unionization and bargaining power. And I think that that's um, in line with everything you were saying earlier. Yeah, I think part of the challenge with leading with legislation, you know, having that job guarantee resolution was very important because now there's at least something we can point to. But it, the average person needs to actually understand how this is going to affect them materially tomorrow. In the same way as a union has a lot of abstract benefits, but what they might experience in the first situation is you just saved us with this one issue in my work, my workplace. They helped me when I was getting fired or when they were not going to give us a raise for this year or something. And so looking out right now and seeing the wave of strikes, the wave of unionization efforts, these are the places where there is a fire being lit around labor. That is the place that we need to try to go to where something new is being done. We want Sarah Nelson to win. If you're in a labor union or whatever, you want her to be our president of the AFL-CIO. You want uh, 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 people like Christian Smalls in the Amazon warehouse to know that what they're doing is fantastic, but also when they get asked about that other thing, they want to say we should have jobs for everybody. The best way to, to make Amazon useless is to not need to work there. Uh, to, make, to, to defeat Amazon is to not need to work there to survive. And, and we can make that point to him, but we're not going to do it by coming to the to a, a rally for the first time, pulling him aside and saying, have you heard of MMT? You're like, that's not going to be the way. So what is the way? I don't have a good answer to that, but that's what we should be all thinking about. Definitely. I think the emphasis on building relationships and building coalitions is so important, especially given, you know, increasing fragmentation and, and polarization both within and uh, between the left. So um, much appreciated. I will say just one last point on that. I, I'm spending a lot of time talking about meeting people where they are, but I don't want to give the impression that we shouldn't have principles. I don't want to give the impression that we shouldn't be very clear about what our red lines are and what we are and aren't willing to compromise on. There are ways to, um, to not have to win every single fight with, with a potential ally. Um, that don't require you to indulge and validate lies or mistakes. And that is also, I think, an important part of, of those kinds of, 
of fights is we need to be willing to um, to say this is not an issue we're going to resolve today. And it's more important to focus on the thing we can resolve. Uh, and I'm not going to be, you know, standing up and validating the thing you said that's wrong, but I'm also going to bite my tongue for this particular moment. And, and just thinking about how you can maintain integrity while working with coalitions that are messy. And that doesn't mean getting into bed with fascists, just to be clear, but it does mean recognizing that not everybody is going to agree with everything you think and that we need to have a coalition big enough to accommodate some of that dissonance. Most definitely. Well, Ro, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. This has been super helpful. Um, and thank you to our audience and everyone who showed up today. Um, we love seeing you guys uh, come out to these events. Um, if you haven't already, make sure that you are registered for next Friday evening's event, which is Tamara Knopper's keynote on abolition and MMT. Um, that is sure sure to be uh, just as insightful if, you know. Um, and otherwise, um, yeah, thank you guys so much. We will see you next week. Thank you so much. Take it easy.